everyone. I truly indeed want to welcome each and every one of you back to 2-in-1 Ministries today. And I want to bless each one of you with a happy Palm Sunday. Even though that is not the subject that we are going to be talking about today, as we move into this holy week of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter next Sunday, I would like to invite each and every one of you to consider Christianity and what is the special meaning of this week? What is the special meaning of Passover and Good Friday and Easter? So um, as we begin our class today, we are actually going to be talking about the seven vile judgments, and these are the last seven judgments that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Interestingly, the theme, as soon as the rapture takes place, from the beginning to the end of the tribulation, is where we see the one world government displayed and how God is pouring out his wrath in order to get the attention of all these millions of lost people that still have not understood that Jesus has come to be the savior of the world. So I just wanted to clarify one thing from last week. As we opened up class last week, I was explaining uh, the verse of Revelation that talks about the false trinity. So we know that the true trinity is God in the form of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So now I'm going to explain a little bit about the false trinity. You hear a lot about the word beast or beast system. So the beast is actually the Antichrist, the man who is the political leader and head of the beast empire. That's the first part of the false trinity. The second part is sometimes referred to as the second beast, and that is the false prophet. He comes like a lamb, and he is the great deceiver. But he is described in Revelation as a dragon, as he reveals who he really is. And he forces all of humanity to worship the Antichrist. And then the third part of the Trinity is Satan himself. And he is the power behind the beast and the false prophet. So, um, I just wanted to clarify that. And then one interesting thought before we begin is how we are seeing this one world system all merging together with all these end time events that are just happening so quickly every day, all day. We can't even keep up with them all. But I wanted to share um, a couple of quick ideas with you about how this B system is coming together. And so I'm taking these ideas from another book called The Last Trump. And this book is written by David William Coster. So he states, and on the 8th of February, 2019, Pope Francis met with the Grand Imam of Egypt's Al-Azhar. And that position of that man in Egypt is described as the highest seat of learning in Sunni Islam, which is a branch of Islam. So, Pope Francis met with this imam and signed a one world religion agreement titled Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. Of course, we know that the Bible warns
warns us, as soon as they say, peace, peace, watch out, sudden destruction is going to come. So we also see how that in this past year in Abu Dhabi, that the Abrahamic family house has just been built. And that is a combination. It's, it's actually, the title of it is called Chermoskog. And the first part of the word, Chur, comes from the Roman Catholic Church, which is described in the book of Revelation as the great whore, representing this idolatrous um, and immoral one world religious system. And so the second part of the word mosque, of course, that comes from uh, the religion, Islam. They um, go to worship in a building called a mosque. And then the third part of the word, og, O-G-U-E, comes from the word synagogue, uh, which, of course, is the place where Jewish people go to worship. So you see here all the religions of the world coming together under the umbrella of the Roman Catholic Church, Islam, and the Orthodox Jews. So you see how uh, that what we are going to be talking about today is the prophecy of the end of the wrathful judgments that God is going to pour out. Um, we are studying from the Harvest Handbook of Bible Prophecy. And this was co-authored by Ed Heinsen, March Hitchcock, and Tim LaHaye. So you might have heard of um, those men. Um, I'm going to focus just a little bit about Tim LaHaye. Um, he started a university in San Diego, which is in California, which is now called San Diego Christian University. And you might also know him by his book series and movie series called Left Behind. So um, he had some of those movies that were specifically written for uh, or produced for children and some of those that were more on a teenage and adult level. So um, again, our theme today is the seven vile judgments. And so um, I hope that you can grab your Bibles and come along and uh, Let's explore this really interesting subject matter and remember that uh, you might say, well, why are we studying prophecy? Well, remember that 27% of the Bible is prophecy and a good part of that is end time prophecies. So if we neglect to study prophecy, then it's like chopping out 27% of the Bible and if God put it there, then he must think it's pretty important. So uh, thanks again for joining us with our teacher, Todd Frederick. Welcome back, and we're uh, continuing our study on the end time prophecies. And we're two-thirds of the way through the judgments uh, regarding the first one was the seal judgments. And then God judged the earth with those, and then he went on to the trumpet judgments, and you can go back and look at those if you haven't already seen them on our other videos, previous ones. And then today we're studying about the uh, vile judgments, and those are found in mostly in chapter 16 of Revelation. And um, basically this is the time in which God is running out of his patience. The, the scripture says that he's slow to anger and slow to wrath. It doesn't say that that he's no to anger and no to wrath. So that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. Uh, kind of like, uh, almost like government, you know, the wheels of the government run slowly. But unfortunately, when uh, they do finally 
make the you know, signing of the document or whatever like that, then that's when, you know, that's that's the law. And that's the way it is kind of with, with God and his presenting of these judgments. He's put up for 6,000 years since uh, Cain first killed Abel and, and all that stuff. He's kind of putting up with man's sin. He almost gave up his patience back uh, with Noah's time, but he found one man in his family that was uh, faithful. Um, so then he gave an extension there uh, of time. So uh, today we're going through the, uh, the vile judgments. Uh, some versions use bold judgments, but I prefer to stay with that which the King James Bible uses as a vile judgment. And maybe it has two meanings there. You know, something's vile, it means it's odious or unpleasant or whatever. Um, and also you figure a vial is what they use in, you know, like uh, laboratories to, you know, mix medicines or whatever like that. And so it could be like the potion or the, the, uh, the formula, the remedy, uh, like a medicine poured out on the earth to, um, to uh, rid it of its uh, disgust and all like that. Um, so in this, uh, we see there is of these three judgments, this is the third, and um, to what is in the in these vials? Of course, uh, this uh, the Bible says not solely what's in it. You know, it's, but you can imagine if you God will find out. You know, He hands each one of these vials to an angel. Uh, you got seven angels, so you got seven vials, and it says it's poured out. So uh, it's almost like a illusionary or maybe a symbolic of where you pour something out, but he pours out his wrath on the earth in each one of these stages that we'll go through and see. So uh, whether it's figuratively or literally something being poured, the thing that pours out is is in this form of a curse, this plague, um, this judgment. And so um, the difference between the judgment of the trumpets and the, the trial, uh, the uh, vile judgments, uh, has to do with the more universal extent of the latter. Um, before it was like when the trumpet judgments took place, um, a third of the earth was the, the trees and green things were burned up, and a third of the water was, you know, turned to blood, and all these things uh, were made. Uh, a wormwood uh, struck it, I should say. So, but this is, is given a universal where it said all, and in several of the cases. But then each one of these angels pours out his vial uh, upon its destined target. So the first uh, vial causes uh, this word we see in the Greek as kornon, or meaning loathsome, uh, or possibly putrefied, uh, as produces these extreme sores on the body. And it's even thought to be perhaps sexual sores. Because if you think about it, even right now, sexual deviance is gone rampant. It's gone from, you know, where you had back in the 50s, like a um, 70 plus percent uh, marriage rate, very low uh, non marriage rate, you know, people living together. That was uh, unheard of back then. Um, so then now it's practically flipped where you have all these people living together, and then you know, a man and a woman, and then you got even worse, you got a man and a man, and then you got a woman and a woman, now you got men thinking they're women, and women thinking they're men, and, and all this, and they're having sexual relationships and that. So it seems like everybody's infatuated with their genitalia these days. So God's gonna pour out this grievous uh, first vial out, and it's thought by uh, theologians that it's probably a, it's a sexual sore, um, the word for sore is, uh, in the Greek, is helkos, which means abscesses or ulcers, and also uh, called malignant, uh, from the Greek word kakos, uh, to basically emphasize their severity. You know, it's not just like something like you get a bug bite and, you know, it goes away. And it's something that's just continually just all over the bodies and just uh, a total irritation. And, it's, and that's what God's poured out on them because for all these centuries and even their own lifetimes that they've been an irritant to God. Somebody goes up to them and gives them a gospel track and they're like, I'm going to sue you because I'm offended. Or they'll take the thing and throw it away or they'll 
uh, blaspheme or spit or something like that, you know. And so, um, so God's going to give them what they've been giving out to others. The golden rule. Basically, God's going to give to them. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to share the scripture that goes with the first vial, and we're going to kind of bounce back and forth. So Todd's going to be teaching about each vial that the angel produces, and then I'm going to kind of back that up with scripture. So we're going to start in Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And then we're going to go into chapter 16 of Revelation now. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. This is the first vial. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. That is the mark 666 and upon them which worshipped his image. Yeah, so that's what we've got finished talking about. So this is, there's seven vials, and so uh, seven is also the number of completion. And uh, so God pours, has the angel pour out that first vial. All these sores come upon the people. Uh, so then God sounds for the second angel to come out, and he, he pours out his vial, and it's uh, poured upon the sea. Can I read that? The second vial. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Yeah. Like I mentioned a while ago in the trumpet judgments, it said a third of the ships were destroyed, and a third of the uh, sea creatures died. But here it says all died. So I guess you could said every living soul. So you can imagine too, uh, well, you don't think of a, a whale or some kind of a sea creature having a soul, but I guess that's kind of given it a denotation here to indicate everything in the sea and above the sea. Uh, say you got sailors coming across there, you know, maybe uh, ship masters or whatever it is, uh, military people, and everything that was in the sea died. I mean, can you think of it like that? You have a you come across a dead body, and uh, you know morticians do that all the time, where they the body comes in, they draw the blood out. That blood is is uh, decaying, it's becoming it's just putrefying. Uh, you couldn't just take that blood out and after a body's been dead for like two or three days and um, say, okay, well we have a person over here that's losing a bunch of blood. Let's take that blood and put it in it. No, it would kill the person. Uh, and that's what happens here. Uh, and so I was thinking. You know, here it is. Anytime there's an abortion takes place, they take the body of that unborn child and and they put it down. They have like in sinkerators that have these high-powered uh, chopping blades and they just run it down. Unless, of course, they can dismember it carefully and then sell the body parts. Uh, but if they run it down in the sinkerator and they have all this uh, blood with it and all like that going out, um, and then we, you don't know it, of course, then our uh, officials, you know, at the water treatment plant, they do everything they can to purify the water and all like that. So they're putting in blood into the system, and we're purifying it to make sure it comes back out clean to where it's potable and drinkable. And then uh, so God's thinking, okay, you you destroyed those people's blood, poured it into your blood, uh, into, this, into your water system. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn your your blood, uh, your, your sea into blood, and and you can drink that, you know, and see if you can purify that. So, uh, God's given back to mankind everything that he thumbed his nose at God and all like that. So then we come on down to see that uh, after this, um, the angel of God cries out that the God is righteous and true, lives forever and who has judged these things, and he's judging not only the people of the earth, but also the earth itself, specifically the waters of this planet. Um, and Paul emphasizes here that 
um, in, to his readers in Rome that uh, in Romans 8.22, you know what she said. Okay, so um, I'm going to read that in just a minute, but first of all, I'm going to be reading about the third vial. This is from Revelation 16, starting in verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And then in Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Yeah, so the first and second, the second and third, rather, uh, vials being poured out affects the waterways. One's like the big seas, and then they... Uh, than the rivers, uh, that's, that's also affected. So, um, and there again, it's like with God looking at all this stuff happening, mankind just I don't think anything about killing somebody. And remember when uh, uh, Cain killed Abel, it says, "What have you done to your brother? Where is he at?" And, and uh, he says, "His blood cries up from the ground." And so you got all this, like I mentioned a while ago, the blood from uh, the aborted babies put right into the sea, uh, into the waterways, and you have the, um, over the years, martyred, the Christians put to the stake to die, to beheaded, um, put to the lions, and all these things, uh, and even to this day, being just persecuted and killed throughout the world, uh, even in, like, Nigeria, places like that, they just go, and no doubt today was another day where uh, Boko Haram or some of these Terrorist groups, they go in there and people are minding their own business, worshiping God and the church, and they go in there and they drag the people out, take the pastor out and beat them, stuff like that. So there's his blood going into the into the ground, uh, seeping into the water, you know, tablets, tables. So mankind has done this, shedding the blood, and so God's going to give them blood to drink. Um, I was going to mention a quick thought here, too, even though... We might not see this side of the Roman Catholic Church today. Um, back in um, the days of um, like the Colosseum, when the Colosseum was set up and everything, um, they would bring these wild beasts in there like lions, and they would... Um, put Christians in there and just let these wild beasts just tear these Christians apart and then they would also um, cut off the heads of Christians and use them as lanterns to line the Romans road um, so yeah, it was pre-Constantine days but then even after that you had like the the, the reign of um, Bloody Mary Queen Bloody Mary and all of them uh, who she is Catholic, you know. And so we see how um, these branches of the One World Church all have their bloody tentacles, um, like Todd was explaining, um, with Islam and the Roman Catholic Church, and and even with the Orthodox Jews, that um, they even threaten Christians in their own family to uh, disown them and sometimes kill them because they're so angry that they left their um, traditional um, religion of their family that they were raised in. Yeah, because of mankind having corrupted the earth, starting back in uh, the Garden of Eden, and like Heather read uh, in Romans, you know, all the creatures in the world are, are suffering at the uh, disobedience of man, and they're, they're desiring to get saved. You know, saved, so to speak, saved from the curse of the, the earth. Because uh, it says that about, you know, all the, all the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. So, every 
creature out there. You know, all these people say, save the whales and save the, the field mouse or whatever. Uh, what we need to do is, if we can get the gospel into the hearts and lives of people, then there'll be less killing, at least on our part. Of course, the animals would still be sitting there, uh, alligator looking out for a deer to snap up or whatever, but can't stop that, but we can stop at least the heart of man, you know, uh, from being continuing in its evil ways um, by giving them the gospel, which takes maybe 17 seconds. How long does it take to give somebody the gospel track? You know, if you don't have time to sit there and explain to them. Um, so if we can get the truth out, and that's what we're trying to do here, warning people, and hopefully you won't be here during this juncture, you know, because this is like way into the uh, tribulation time. So then the third angel, he's poured out his wrath upon the rivers of water. And then next comes up the uh, uh, fourth vial being poured out. And so it says uh, that this wrath of God falls upon the sun. Imagine that. God pours out this, has the angel pour out his vial upon the earth, uh, upon the sun. Uh, so I think. I mean, how the size of the sun, you know, a little vial, but however way it's done, you know, of course, an angel can be uh, fireproof and stand right on the surface of the sun, pour it out, or however he does it. But um, we read that in uh, Revelation 4. Um, Starting in verse 8, the fourth vial. Mm -hmm. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Yeah. I want to go back to that other verse there talking about the Romans 8, 20 and 21, where it talks about the creature is made subject to vanity, but not willingly. Okay. Um, it says... In Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That is when something is um, spoiled or ruined, um, decayed. So it says, because the creature itself also should be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Yeah, so going back to that last thought, though, um, you know, all this world is going to be totally, as we'll find out towards the end of this study, uh, the curse will be lifted, everything will be renewed, the uh, Satan will be out off the scene, evildoers will be not present because there'll be no thing that worketh an abomination that comes into the presence of God uh, at that time. So all the world will be set back in order. Um, so if you're an animal lover or a people lover or something like that, um, best thing to be sure that you're saved. That way you can be in this perfect environment and be able to enjoy this resetting uh, of the earth back to um, a time of where it was before, where everything wasn't subject to the bondage of corruption. And uh, so with this going back to the sun, uh, being having the vial poured out on it though, it says that the sun would then be able to produce an enormous amount of heat. And it says it'll scorch men. So people are talking about uh, climate change and global warming and all like that. There'll be a global warming then because somehow God's going to have it to where when he pours that vial through the angel doing it, Upon the sun, it's going to produce such an, an enormous amount of heat that it's going to scorch men. And it doesn't say about other animals dying or anything like that. It's just going to, um, even the men won't be dying. They'll be just scorched. It'll be like having a probably a 130 degree summer day or something like that, or maybe 140. I don't know. It's going to be extremely uncomfortable. And then uh, it says that the men. Um, when they were scorched with the heat, blasphemed the name of God. So they, instead of saying, wait a minute, I see why this is happening. It's because of my fault. I've been disobedient to God. Probably had a child like that before that you're thinking, why, why doesn't my child get it? You know, I ask him not to do this, or I ask him to keep, you know, 
keep his head in the books and, and make good grades and he comes home with bad grades and, and uh, hanging out with bad friends. So I've done everything I can and he still doesn't get it. He, and that's the way it is with mankind. It's just part of the sin nature. So um, does this bring about repentance? No. Uh, these people continue to blaspheme God. I just want to bring out a quick point about um, climate change. Well, first of all, we serve a sovereign God, and the Bible tells us that by God all things consist. And so he's holding all the planets in space right now, and he's holding the earth at such a distance from the sun so that we don't burn up. Um, and yet we are close enough to the sun so that we don't freeze to death. So what we're seeing right now, as far as um, climate change goes, is not anything that God is doing. Man's pouring out his wrath on the earth right now. So uh, you might say, what do I mean by that? Well, when you look up in the sky and you see all these crisscrosses in the sky after these planes go by um, and it's spraying out all these chemicals known as chemtrails, uh, that is man pouring out his wrath on the earth and spraying out all these chemicals to ruin the vegetation and the air we breathe. That's the only climate change that we are seeing because God says he is going to have the four distinct seasons of summer, fall, winter, and spring as long as the earth shall be. So what we're seeing now is man's wrath. But in the seven-year tribulation period, that is when the world will see unprecedented times that no man has ever seen before. And so in this lesson, we are seeing um, God's wrath poured out on mankind for their rebellion and, and lack of belief in him and lack of repentance and sorrow over their sins. And so, um, anyway, I just wanted to um, clarify that little point because of all the, the warped uh, news going on right now about the terminology climate change. Yeah, and see, the whole thing with this, uh, these judgments at this point, of course, the other ones as well, but at this, during this juncture is that those who receive the mark of the beast in their hand or forehead, they're the ones that's going to be having these experiences. Um, the judgment is poured out upon them. And uh, it says no matter how painful the tribulation, most people will not come to God. I would have to say no people will come to God uh, because it's poured out on those who are and uh, align themselves with the Antichrist. Now there'll be some there that are saved, and maybe that's what they mean, that some who still haven't taken the mark of the beast or haven't decided on Christ yet, they just want to let you know, things be like they were before. Go back to the old norm. <laughs> instead of the, the, except this is like the new norm, all this stuff going on. So, um, but there will be some that perhaps will say, but of course they won't be the ones um, with the mark of the beast. We already clarified that in the scriptures before, that whoever receives the mark of the beast will not ever be able to be redeemed. Um, so these who uh, are experienced in this, says uh, that they won't they won't humble themselves and they won't repent and you see that even now you know we've got people that are blatantly living their lives uh, in a abominable way uh, even in what they think is the normal way you know well you know it's just me and me and my boyfriend you know I don't have like five boyfriends I go visit from this house to his house and you know and uh and, uh, like a like a be considered like a whore you know I just I just whore around with one guy uh, so anyway, people like that, they're still not humbling themselves, not repenting, and then they uh, are receiving, as was said before, with the, with the third plague, the angel said that uh, just and true art thou in thy judgments. And so he, they've shed blood, and they're, they're given blood to drink. These here, uh, they've at the, up to this point still haven't repented. They received the mark of the beast. Of course, they can't that was their seal upon themselves so they are just still you think that they would say it 
I'm sorry, God, or something like that, but they're they're not. They're just still bullheaded and wanting to do what they um, desire, which is sin. Uh, so the answer on man's part to express the wrath of God is no. And the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But if you look at the word there is, that's italicized. And so that word, if you take it out, the italicized words in the King James Bible was ones that were put in to help the sentence flow better. But if you take out that word there is and look at it how it says it in the original, the fool has said no to God. No God. So he's saying, I'm going to pour out this wrath upon you. And then instead of saying, I'm sorry, they say, no. And then they're just even more hardened. Uh, that's not the way they react. And especially not right now when you got the opportunity to re repent. Um, so these people who are totally so unredeemable and thoroughly corrupt, um, they're fulfilling the will of man. Well, the will of man is, is wrath from God. Instead of fulfilling the will of God, which is that all men should repent. <clears throat> so, the fifth judgment um, we see comes we, it's uh, make sure we, oh yeah, we read six through nine, eight, eight through nine, so let's uh, do 16, 10 through 11. Okay. So, um, right before I read about the fifth vial, um, we need to go back to the book of Exodus and remember that just like these plagues are being poured out on those that are rebellious and want to go their own way and don't want to do things God's way, that's how it was in um, Egypt when the Israelites were there for 430 years under the slavery of Pharaoh and his Egyptian armies. Um, when God told Moses to pour out these plagues on Egypt, which were against each one of the false gods of Egypt, then um, we see that God spared the Israelites that believed in him from these plagues. And so these plagues are specifically poured out on those that have received the mark of the beast and they've sold their soul to Satan and we know that people that receive the mark of the beast can never be saved. And that's what's so very sad about this. But it's a warning to all of us to grab the moment now while we still have a short amount of time before the rapture. And make sure that we have given our hearts to Jesus. And that we've repented of our sins. So that we're not going to be left behind to worry about all these terrible tragedies. So, in the fifth vial, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So, I kind of look at this plague as like the darkness was so piercing and pervasive that, um, you know, of course, they, they had their, um, their sores, too, from the previous plague. But even this darkness itself was painful, uh, very ominous to go through. Yeah, and see, they didn't repent of their sins. And uh, here it is. You got the Antichrist. He goes in, as we read uh, a week or so ago, about he went into the uh, tabernacle and into the to the temple and to the Holy of Holies and declared himself as God. But then here it is, he and the others are blaspheming God for uh, sending this, uh, this uh, darkness. And so it's like uh, man talks and thinks in circles because if he's the Antichrist, if he's the God of the world and the universe and all like that, this uh, Antichrist figure, the beast, then he should be able to say, I've got this under control. Zap. Okay. No more darkness. No more blood. Kind of like the way the Egyptians did. Uh, how they tried to, you know, the magicians tried to reverse everything. Uh, some things they could and others they couldn't. Like the lice, they couldn't reverse it. And some of the others. Um, so they continued to blaspheme. 
Uh, these are people that have sold their soul out. They hadn't. When it came time for them to receive Christ, they didn't. They received the mark. And uh, I guess we read last week that, that uh, Jesus said, He that saves his life shall lose it. Those people save their life so that way they could have position and prominence and all like that during the, this reign of the, uh, the beast. Uh, so they save their life, but then after that, they, they lose it. But then those who was confronted with, you uh, you receive this mark or else you'll die. So they said, well, we'll die. So they lost their life, but they got to save it. And so when you do those things, which don't seem logical, uh, but they're biblical, then that's when you uh, are serving the king of kings. These saved their life, but they became totally hardened against God, and then they uh, couldn't repent. Question. Do you think that maybe this physical darkness was put upon them to remind them of their spiritually dark hearts and minds? Yeah, that's a, a good uh, analysis there, because you figure uh, their evil hearts were darkened. Uh, there's a point there. Um, and another scripture. So, when you reject the, the light of Christ, you are going more and more into darkness. So they desire darkness. Remember it said that they uh, desired to, to shed blood, so give them blood. They desired dark, uh, they desired light, but light from Satan, which is darkness, so give them darkness. And it's kind of interesting how the, the darkness was so dark that they felt it. Um, I don't know if that was like, from a fear standpoint, you know, like uncertainty and stuff like that, or they just that in combination with uh, the temperature drop. I mean, obviously, if it's totally dark out, it can be a huge temperature drop. Um, but it was, however, it was it, it's also uh, created pain. You figure some people they can tell when there's gonna uh, a cloud and the rain come in the next day or so because their rheumatoid arthritis tells them that. So maybe they had some kind of pain like that in their bones. Um, I don't know, whatever it was that God had incorporated a curse that they could feel by being dark. So, uh, the kingdom of the beast, um, one particular person, I don't know if this is Henry Morris, it just says Morris, but uh, one theologian said that he didn't think that the kingdom uh, of the beast referred to the whole world, but only to his particular kingdom the base from which he later would acquire control over all other kingdoms. Um, I imagine at this point he's pretty much in the throes of heaven, the, uh, the entire world over his, uh, under his control. Uh, so that's just one man's perspective, but, but with it being poured out on the seat of the beast, you'd think that, that'd be like the White House, for example. Uh, uh, God poured out a, uh, a curse upon the seat of the Oval Office of course, all Biden staff and security guys, and you know, and uh, everybody. Just, um, I can't remember her name now. Uh, Lop here. What's her name? The secretary, press, or whatever. Who's in the room in the press? They'd feel this noisome, uh, grievous darkness and painting and all like that. Maybe it's just in that particular quarters, or maybe it's throughout the whole world. But nonetheless, it's poured out upon the seat of the beast and you know it's kind of like uh, if he feels bad then everybody else is going to feel bad because <laughs> uh, he's going to make them feel bad because he's supposed to be the, the the god of the grand architect of the universe I guess so um, this sixth angel then pours out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and that's in Revelation 16 12 through 16 Yes, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So you think uh, about maybe some countries um, like China, perhaps. India. And I, yes, in India. India. They're, they're aligning themselves right now with, uh, with uh, Russia. Right. Even more so because instead of us trying to keep a good relationship with Russia and all like that, we've sided with with Europe, which they didn't do much. <laughs> we had to bail them out back in World War II. Um, and then 
Russia and, and the United States were two big world powers back then that kind of worked together. So you think that we wouldn't have cut our nose off to spite our face, but um, we've done more crazy things. Okay, so um, again, this is still about the sixth vial. So it says then in verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There again, we see the satanic false trinity. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, just like Todd mentioned a few minutes ago about the miracles that the satanic magicians did in Egypt to try to mimic God's miracles. So they also have power, of course, but not as nearly as much as God's power. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. What great battle? Well, we're going to hear about that in just a second. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So a lot of people... Uh, know about the Battle of Armageddon, but they misplace it in the wrong time. So the Bible describes it as happening here at the very end of the seven-year tribulation period. Yeah, and Armageddon footnote here says it's also called the Mount of Slaughter. And that's what's going to be happening. You know, they got all these uh, kings and, and uh, lieutenants and you know, footmen and horsemen and all all that's going to be gathered coming from that dried up, crossing that dried up river going into Israel. So these are going, going to all fight against God, which odd enough that he's not in Jerusalem. Uh, he's in heaven. And I forgot to share with you um, this other passage that... Um, uh, describes more in detail the battle of Armageddon from Revelation chapter 19 verses 17 through 21. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. So you think about all these big birds like vultures that um, eat the prey of dead, carnage. the carnage of dead animals now, but at that time it'll be dead people. That ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So you have all these kings of the east and all these well-known kings of the earth coming against God and the army of the saints that are going to come back from heaven to fight this battle of Armageddon. Yeah. Um, and so ultimately what they're doing is they're thinking that they can, Satan's always, he, he can't attack God himself, so he attacks his people, or would-be people. So evidently his plan is to gather up all these armies, cross over and go into Jerusalem to destroy the seed of um, the offspring of Abraham, which would be the Israelis. Um, and ultimately that's who God's attention is towards to redeem during that time. Uh, this 70th week of Daniel. So um, they think, well, we're going to go over here and destroy the Israelites, despite God, because we can't fight God. He's up there. You know? um, so then God comes down through Christ and defeats them. That was a good point to bring out. 
And then um, we'll pick back up on verse 20 of Revelation 19. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So you think about um, the lake of fire that you might see uh, of magma flowing out of a volcano is the best way that uh, we can picture that in our minds today. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. Of course, that is Jesus, because it says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Yeah, the word of God. Remember, God spoke and the world came into existence. So all Jesus has to do is doesn't have to have a you know, uh, sophisticated instruments and fighting power and all like that, like we do. All you have to do is just say, Beast Antichrist, be cast out in the hell, in, in the lake of fire. And that, that's happened. And he says, okay, the rest of you be slain. And just speaks it. And, and they're just ran through, uh, killed, and all that. So uh, the Lord speaks, and then it, it comes to pass. So we have to keep in mind, look at your own Bible from Genesis to Revelation and see... What is it that God said that didn't come true? And look at it from Genesis to Revelation, what Satan has said, and if it came true. Um, and then compare that, because one day you're going to be faced, if you're not already a Christian, one day you're going to face standing before the Antichrist, and, or one of his minions who's going to demand that you uh, get yourself in line with this world community, uh, otherwise you're going to be an enemy, and hearken back to this study that that the, this guy, the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, were cast in a lake of fire, and that they deceived them that received the mark of the beast. So keep that in mind. The beast is a deceiver. God in him is no lie. Neither can he lie. And, uh, and you just look throughout his whole testimony. Everything God spoke happened. You listen to a deceiver, you'll be with him in the lake of fire, just like that. Uh, so, his meeting place was the final conflict of the armies of the earth. This where the, the Euphrates River dries up, which is a, some 2,000 mile river that flows from Syria, Turkey through Syria, all the way down into the uh, Arabian Sea. So, you figure that's going to dry up. And in some places, it's almost a mile wide. It's like two-thirds of a mile wide. You can't, of course, cross it with armies to get there. You can, of course, fly over it and, and uh, parachute in your man, but then, of course, there's people there ready to shoot them down and all like that. But uh, when it's dried up, it's just like the kings of the east are going to come right across into Jerusalem. Um, so they think. So that's going to be uh, this meeting place there in uh, the Valley of Megiddo, which is Armageddon. And uh, so you have this great battle that takes place, which... Uh, None of the saints will be killed. All the followers of the Antichrist will be killed. And this uh, great feast of the uh, fowls of the air are going to, instead of you know these bodies, horses and men laying around, and women, the transgenders, or whoever's in, all going to be there, they're going to be laying there dead. Instead of having to sit there and rot, the, God's going to call the fowls together to, to feast. They're going to pick the flesh off the bones, and the bones you know, won't cause any disease, just them lying there. Um, and so it's going to be like that. It's going to be um, almost like um, almost like a, a, instead of like the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is going to be a marriage supper for the earth, so to speak. I mean, the fowls there are going to be like, hey, this is feast time. So they're going to have their feast. And then during the uh, uh, millennial reign, we'll have our feast. Yes, on earth, so that we studied before. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking about this years ago when I, it was back 2015 or sometime back, uh, 14. I had to drive out to Dallas, Texas, and on the way there, I can't remember what uh, interstate that was, but I was driving through Alabama and through uh, New Orleans and somewhere along in there, 
off to the distance you could see this big mound of dirt and what it was it was a, a landfill and it was like thousands of of uh, birds like basically scavenger birds uh, vultures various things like that just flying around and i was thinking that seeing that amazing sight i was like that's the way it's going to be in the battle of armageddon so uh it's kind of ominous but that's going to definitely come to pass so when this river dries up god will um make it so that he'll he'll put it in their hearts too to do it because you know it's kind of like pharaoh he kept saying no to god and no to god so finally he just put it in his heart to say okay um uh, go after the israelites you know and so he did and um if you're not careful your decisions that you make opposite to god he'll say okay we well, just do that and let you go your way and fall on your own sword so um when judgment falls on the river euphrates with this vial being poured out it'll dry up and make the way for the preparation of uh, the kings to come and we see in zechariah um, chapter 10 verse 10 through 11 Yes, and it says, And I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea, and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I, I think that's really interesting to note how uh, back in Egypt, at the Exodus, when God dried up the Red Sea for his people, the Israelites, to cross through, it was that invitation of Pharaoh and his soldiers to think that they could also follow them through on dry land. And then at that point, God closed up the sea like a tsunami wall on each side that came together and drowned them. Only the destruction in the Battle of Armageddon will be um, also with the Word of God, but... Um, that it'll be more of like um, they'll be uh, visually facing God and seeing that it is he that has come against them to destroy them. Uh, a little more visual than um, when Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed. Yeah, it's kind of like instead of the, the seas parting like it did or the river in this case, parting so that way Israel could escape. It's actually, in this case, is for the uh, Pharaoh's army, so to speak, to, to go across. Whereas before Pharaoh's army was drowned, this way it's going to dry up. This way the army can get across, the armies. And uh, so then and once they cross over the, the dried up sea, or the river, then that's when God's going to destroy them. Not through a flood, but through, uh, through his word. And uh, these kings are the kings of the east. Um, and so you think everything that's east of of Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Turkey, uh, not, uh, only the India and uh, and uh, China. It's interesting that during the during the uh, reign of was it Artaxerxes and them that his kingdom included India. So. Um, interesting thought there, but see, the next, the uh, seventh angel pours out his vial upon the earth, his vial of wrath. Yes, so the seventh vial, and this is found starting in verse 17 of Revelation 16. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunder, I'm sorry, thunders, plural, and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth 
so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now keep in mind that Babylon was a city of great idolatry and immorality. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone, that's talking about hailstones. So each one of those hailstones was about the weight of a talent. Now one talent weighed 75 pounds. Can you imagine that? Just one hailstone falling upon you? And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Yeah, and see, uh, if you go back to like Pergamos, message to Pergamos, uh, Jesus says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Um, and so Satan has his dwelling place in the Middle East somewhere. And the one place it said where our Lord was uh, crucified. I was trying to find that. It, and it said that that city of Sodom and also uh, where the city of Sodom where Christ was crucified outside of Jerusalem. So apparently Satan has a seat somewhere in, in the same maybe country of Israel even. Um, but he he's definitely got his domain in that original place setting where man came first into the world. And so this is where uh, everything's going to end. Uh, all the armies of the world are going to converge together and be taken out. And then uh, God's going to have a great earthquake in that great city Babylon. Uh, it could be either the literal city Babylon, which would be I think it was probably a little more possible that they would be rebuilt back during the time of uh, between 20 and 20, 20, the year 2000 to 2020, um, <clears throat> because that's when we were fighting against Iraq and freeing them and thought, well, maybe they'll rebuild Babylon, but maybe that it's uh, spiritual Babylon, and maybe that instead um, this great city would be um, still in that region, but it's going to fall in three parts, just and uh, the earthquake's going to be so great, so great that it's going to be causing all the islands to just be basically done away with. They're going to flee away. They're going to uh, no longer exist. Um, so I guess if you live in some of these countries, um, like the Dominican Republic or <laughs> Australia or something like that, these um, these uh, this earthquake's going to cause all these islands to be affected. You see that in verse twenty. Um, Revelation 16, 20. Um, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So that's a pretty big earthquake. I mean, recently had a pretty bad earthquake last month, you know, in Turkey where, and Syria. And uh, everybody's concerned about that, and it was indeed horrific. But this is going to be like that scale multiplied by 100 throughout the whole world. Because this, every island, not even going to just be in the Middle East, like Cyprus maybe. You know, go under, but all the mountains are going to be shaken down. Imagine that. Everybody has a house on the side of the mountain or at the foot of the mountain. Those mountains are going to just be shaken down like this and leveled. That's what it says here. Um, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So it's just going to be like all flat. Um, you know, it talks about the warming of the climate. You know, it's going to cause the sea to rise and and islands will be covered with water, and uh, well, don't worry about that in a few years, but those islands are going to be gone anyway. Um, I was just going to add an interesting thought here that I was just thinking about. You know, I think that we did not comprehend um, what a worldwide plague was, or a worldwide curse, or whatever you call it, until the man-made COVID came along. And 
I think that what we're seeing in the tribulation time is, of course, even so much greater than COVID. Um, but that gives us a small picture of what uh, a worldwide problem looks like. You know, um, when the Bible describes the perilous times that we're in right now, the end times preceding the rapture, we're seeing like pockets of problems, like uh, a train derailment here, an earthquake there, a volcano in this part of the world. But we're not seeing all um, converge at the same time in every place of the world, like what is described here. So I think um, that these one worlders, these satanic people, are delighting in the convergence that COVID has brought upon the world and trying to, um, you know, create a problem, which is a disease called COVID. And then they have the quote unquote solution, which is the COVID shot, which has done nothing but kill millions of people around the world, including children. Um, but it's for the purpose of um, their, ter in their terminology, the Great Reset, which we know is nothing other than what the Bible describes is the Great Tribulation. So even though it seems like the world is falling apart, um, in reality, things are falling into place exactly according to Bible prophecy. So the exciting thing is, is that even though we live in these dangerous times, these are the days that the prophets long to see because we have all these reaffirmations of all these prophecies that are being fulfilled every day on the news, even though, like I said, they're negative, but they're reconfirming to us God's character is sure, his promises are real, and his prophecies are being unfolded before us every single day. And so we see how close the tribulation must be. And even in Israel right now, they're having commercials about the rebuilding of the third temple and how excited they are about this soon coming third temple that we know will not be a holy place. It will be the abode of, of Satan, the Antichrist. Um, but the point is that we know that if the tribulation is this close with the rebuilding of the third temple, how much closer the rapture must be. And so that is the exciting thing for Christians. That is the blessed hope that we're looking for. And like I said at the beginning of class today, um, we do want to invite anyone who is not sure that you know Jesus is your personal Savior to consider Christianity and to repent of your sins and believe in God and get your heart in agreement with the perfect Word of God because God loves you more than you love yourself and He does have a beautiful plan for your life if you let Him have your life for now and for all eternity. Yeah, this section here that we're going through. Um, now, Heather mentioned earlier about Ed Heinsohn and Hitchcock and LaHaye, and they basically were editors that comp basically took these various topical studies together and then put them into book form because obviously the people who contributed like this, Dr. Mal Couch, um, he was the uh, late president of Tyndall Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. So obviously he wasn't around to contribute that. So they picked the best resources to put together in this book. And uh, this Dr. Couch had said that he thought that um, the city, this great city that was broken up in three parts uh, due to the earthquake was uh, either Jerusalem or Babylon. I'm not sure what when he died or whatnot, but um, the lot probably has transpired since then. One is that Babylon still hasn't been rebuilt, but Jerusalem has been. You know, uh, Israel came together as a nation back in 1948. Yes. And so 
Uh, they definitely have been rebuilt and growing and everything like that. They've taken many parts that were desert and uh, through aqueducts and stuff like that, made them into uh, livable places, farmland, stuff like that. So they definitely uh, could be this great city. And of course, if you think about it, um, the temple that they built, God can't come down and walk in here and say, behold, now I'm your God, because this thing is painted. He asked, he told David, he says, uh, you know, you sh how can you build the Lord a house? Because heaven is his, his house and earth is his footstool. And uh, those type things. So he's not going to come down here and say, okay, well, let's do a little patchwork here and, and uh, you know, blood sacrifice over the sea to, you know, to get the, the cooties off from the beast or whatever. So he, he's going to set up his kingdom on earth, but I'm kind of thinking that he won't because if the city of Jerusalem gets broken up in three parts, that, that temple's going to be like cracked and everything gone. Of course, it's sitting up on a hill and uh, every mountain will be leveled course uh, through that earthquake so a lot of things there to think about and then of course at the end of the thousand year millennial reign uh, after Satan is put down and everything like that the, the millennial reign set up well he's not put down totally but um, so at the end of the thousand years when everything that is corrupt is, is cast into the lake of fire then God's holy city Jerusalem will come down from heaven as uh, John measures it and like that is so that's where it, God's of O's going to be uh, in that in that uh, temple slash you know where we're going to live <laughs> so anyway it's not going to be uh, God's not going to be doing any little patchwork because at the end we see that God will make a new heaven and a new earth he's going to rid this place uh, and then rebuild it and it's do it all over again um, so the result of this uh, great earthquake is also going to level all these monuments and stuff you figure the, the national monument in the united and uh, in washington dc which is um a perverted symbol um masonic symbol all these things like that's just going to be crumpled down and and laid waste and they ought to be um and then so all these things man's accomplishments all these trump tower and everything else you know they're going to be all leveled uh, and so these um Man's works are going to be just like brought to shambles. You know, it's like, so you ought to ask yourself, what is it I'm doing with my life that's going to stand God's test? When we talked about that about four weeks ago with the uh, Bema Judgment Seat of Christ. So you ought to look at that video. If you're a Christian, then you're, all your works are going to be tested and tried and see if they be able to give you a reward. If not, then, then it's going to be like wasted. Um, if you're not a Christian, your works are going to be a witness against you um, that you deserve hell uh, because your works were evil because you rejected the only begotten Son of God and didn't have those taken away from against you, against your account. Um, so the sweeping statement in, in uh, verse 20 is that every island is affected and, and the mountains disappeared. Uh, the fierceness of God's wrath is shown in these things. In verse 19, literally the anger of his wrath is manifested in the entire physical world. So, in order for God to make things right, he's got to, it's almost like if you get a house that, you know, uh, it's been set negligent for years, neglected, maybe some little lady owned it, her husband died 20, 30 years ago, and she just kind of did what she could, she's on social security, and the roof starts leaking and the plumbing starts going bad and so she's pretty much just living like in one room with one bathroom over here and, and the heater's gone out so she has a little space heater and, and then eventually she dies. So you get the house and you buy it and it's, it's a, like a, a Victorian two-story house, you know, it's just, uh, it was amazing back when it was built in the 1800s or something, you know, and, but you look at this thing and think, this thing is ruined. And so what do you do? You, you, you gut it out in that case. Uh, and then you rebuild it. In this case, God's going to make a new heaven and new earth. He's going to rid everything of all the rottenness, any sign of any kind of idol or monument or anything like that. Or, you know, let's say if uh, in, uh, in the millennial reign or beyond the millennial reign into eternity, somebody's out there just, you know, in the yard digging up something or 
they pull up a little idol and you start the whole process all over again. No, it's all going to be gone. Uh, God's going to make it all new. And uh, so the seal judgments, trumpet, and bowl judgments um, probably are the spine of the tribulation events, according to uh, Dr. Couch. He says these seven angels pouring out the seven bowls of wrath are indeed a, quote, great sign for them that and for them uh, is finished, for in them is finished the wrath of God. In these signs, these seal, trumpet, and vile judgments, in those God's judgments and this great sign of those who want to do wickedly and uh, speak out against God and blaspheme and all like that, uh, but that's their sign. Um, and if they could, but because of their pride and indifference and all like that, um, they won't be repentant. A few of them may, like I said, if they hadn't received the mark of the beast. And so we see, we shall see them uh, proceed from the temple of God in heaven. Uh, all patience from God has now been exhausted, is basically what Couch concluded. So, well, those things, we'll leave you with that to think about. Yes, and uh, one last verse comes to mind, and this is from the book of Matthew. And it says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So think with me about like going to the beach and you're, um, you're creative. Let's say you have artistic ability. Let's say you're an engineer. So you love making these like beautiful, artistic, gorgeous sandcastles at the beach. So what happens when high tide comes in? That beautiful sandcastle gets suddenly washed away. And that's what's going to happen if we try to build a kingdom on earth and serve ourselves and forget about God. It's just all like going to be washed away. Just like that verse says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and, and lose his own soul? And, and then uh, the converse of that is if we get saved and we are doing things for the glory of God, then we're building the kingdom of God. And those are the only things that we can take to heaven are the souls of people that we have led to a saving knowledge, um, like we've uh, told people how to get saved, and then they repented of their sins and believed that Jesus died and rose again for them. So the only thing we can take to heaven are the saved people and then the foundation of the good works that we have done through the power of God after we got saved. So those good works don't save us. But like we studied about a few weeks ago, the behemoth judgment seat of Christ is the reward judgment for Christians. So the second thing that we uh, can take to heaven are the fruits or the labors of our good works here on earth to have seen other people grow in the Lord and to try to bless other people in the name of the Lord. Um, those are the things that God was going to reward us for. So, uh, again, um, let's think about, um, am I ready for the rapture? We can escape these wrathful days in the future tribulation if we are ready for the rapture today. And the only way to get ready for the rapture is to get saved. So, um, let me invite you to think about your soul today. Because after all, that's the most important decision that you can ever make in your life. Okay, well, I want to leave you with this one last thought here in Psalm 103, 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And so if you think about it, let's say a, a child, 8 or 10 years old, is caught stealing something. And he's, he's caught and put in juvenile arrest or whatever and taken and stood before a judge. The judge is going to be 
uh, merciful to him, in a sense. He's not going to neglect the law, but he's going to be merciful to him. Now, let's say that kid doesn't learn his lesson. He keeps getting more and more hardened to where he's finally like 30 years old and he's, he's caught uh, robbing a bank. And he shoots the teller. She's badly wounded. He makes away with a bunch of money and he's caught. He left behind a, his cell phone. <laughs> At least somebody recently just did that. Robbed the place and left his cell phone there. So anyway, they catch the guy, the same judge, all these years later, still in the, the courthouse. You know, uh, and he hears his case. He's like, wait a minute, I remember you when you was like eight. And I gave you a light sentence. In fact, too light, because I see it didn't do any good. You didn't repent. And in fact, I showed you mercy and plenty of that. And I showed you grace. But now, you injured somebody. She's potentially going to die. And you've got this unrepentant spirit. Now I'm going to have to pour out the wrath. So you're going to get life in prison without parole. And, and if the woman dies, you're going to get the death penalty. See, that's the way the Lord is. He's merciful and uh, slow to anger and, uh, and plenteous, you know, plenteous in mercy and gracious and all like that. But if you continue with your hardness of heart, moving through your life, doing what you want, blaspheming God, hanging out with bad people, uh, aligning yourselves with people who are going to take you away from God, then you're going to be like that judge and that unrepentant thief. And uh, you're going to get the books thrown at you. Unfortunately, your name's not going to be in the book of life. So think about that. Ask yourself, if I stand before the God of all the earth, where will I stand on his side? On the side of mercy or his wrath? So with that, have a great time. Enjoy your... Uh, day and we'll see you next time and be sure to click share and